Hello everyone, this video is gonna be about another external interrupt source called interrupt on change. This will be in a way continuation to my previous two videos, so if you don't understand the concept or a term I use, I recommend watching those videos first, the link to which you can find in the description below. Also, I'll put a link down below for the code files, which you can download and copy paste into your own code, to follow along or tinker with. I'll put them in txt format, so you can open them in the text editor. But you can just change their format back to .c, like this. Since .c files are also plain text, this shouldn't affect them. I'll also specify which example code is relevant at the beginning of each example, so you'll know which one is which. So, let's get started. Try to remember the term IOC, which stands for Interrupt on Change, as I'll be using the abbreviation more than the full name, since it's so long. You can think of IOC as a budget or alternative external interrupt. They're similar in nature, but the use cases of IOC are a bit more specific. It actually has a lot of traps you may fall into, which is why I don't recommend using it unless you have to. Use external interrupts instead if you can. This interrupt source connects to multiple pins. In our microcontroller's case, these are RB7, RB6, RB5 and RB4 pins. These pins can be individually configured as IOC, and if any of the pins that are configured as IOC changes state, an interrupt occurs. But be careful, we're talking about state change here, so unlike the external interrupts, there is no high to low or low to high transition. This interrupt detects any state change, so both transitions will cause interrupts. This property of detecting both transitions makes this interrupt useful in reading things like encoders, where both transitions are important. So depending on the situation, it can be considered a feature. Also note that any state change of any pin configured as IOC will cause the same interrupt, so the pins don't have individual interrupt flags for them, instead they share the same one interrupt flag. So even if only one of the pins change state, the same interrupt will occur, so it's up to you to determine which pin state changed in software by reading and comparing them throughout your code. There is also a problem for this microcontroller. Two of the IOC pins are also used for programming. There can be complications when these pins are used for both programming and IO at the same time, so I recommend avoiding that. If you really need to use these pins as IOC, disconnect your circuit before programming. Then disconnect the programmer and connect your circuit again. Maybe I'll make a dedicated video about this in the future, but I would just recommend avoiding this altogether, especially because with this conflict, you won't be able to debug your project no matter what. Let's make a quick example for interrupt on change. I'll connect two buttons to the RB5 and RB4 pins, as they have IOC functionality. I'll also connect resistors to pull these pins to ground, and I'll connect the other side of the button to 5 volts, so that initially these pins will be connected to ground, and whenever I press the buttons, they will connect to 5 volts. Then, I'll connect the resistor and an LED to the bottom two pins, so that I can use them as outputs and see their status through the LEDs. Let's quickly configure and see how the IOC works. This is going to be the IOC example 1. As always, first things first, IO configurations. We have to configure these button pins as inputs and the LED pins as outputs. So I'll go ahead and quickly clear the trist bits of the LED pins to configure them as outputs. Then I'll clear their lat bits as well to connect them to ground, so that the LEDs are off at the beginning of our code. Now, I'll set the trist bits of the button pins to configure them as inputs, while also clearing their cell bits to make them a digital one. Now we can get to configuring the interrupts. I'll quickly configure the global bits first. I'll set the IPEN bit to enable priorities, even though I'll only use one interrupt source. Like I said before, there's no reason to disable the priorities for beginners. I suggest always enabling them, so that you can get used to them. I'm also only going to set the GIEH bit, since I'll only use the high priority interrupts. I won't touch the GIEL bit for this video. Now let's configure the IOC interrupt. And like I said before in the previous video, when configuring interrupts, always follow their dedicated datasheet sections. It says that each pin has an IOCB bit that we need to configure to enable their IOC functionality. If we check these bits in the datasheet, you can see that we have to set them in order to enable their IOC function. So I'll do just that for the RB5 and RB4 pins, using these two bits. Next, we have priority, flag and enable bits to configure. I'll configure this interrupt as high priority. I'll skip explaining these, I'm assuming you get the idea after the last two videos. 
and as always, I'll put comments for each line of code as well. In the main code, I'll constantly turn these LEDs on. This way, we can tell whenever we're not in the interrupt routine. Now we gotta write the interrupt code. For now, we'll keep it simple. I'll just turn the LEDs off whenever an interrupt occurs. I'll also put one second delay so that we can see it happening, which will also serve as the bouncing. And of course, we need to clear the flag bit before exiting. I'll also shroud this code in an if statement that checks the flag and the enable bits for IOC to only have it executed when the interrupt on change occurs. We don't have to do this since we only have one interrupt source to begin with, but I want to keep my examples consistent with the previous video. Now let's program and see. As you can see, if I press any of the buttons, an interrupt occurs, since the state of the RB5 or RB4 pin changes. But this code is actually wrong. This is only working because of luck, or because we're using buttons. This is the first and biggest trap when using interrupt on change. Watch what happens when I keep holding down a button. Do you see it? IOC detects the state change of the pins and causes an interrupt, right? So when I press the button, the RB4 pin changed state which caused an interrupt. The interrupt code got executed, and the flag bit got cleared, right? But even though I'm not releasing the button, which means the new state of the RB4 pin is not changing, the microcontroller still doesn't execute the main code. Instead, the LEDs are still off, meaning we're constantly in the interrupt routine, unable to leave, which would also mean the interrupt flag is still set, even though we're supposed to clear it here. However, if I release the button, the LEDs light up again which means we're able to leave the interrupt routine and execute the main code. To understand why this is happening, we need to understand the circuit inside of the microcontroller. The way this interrupt works is that the microcontroller compares a hidden register with the current port B register. And whenever a read operation is performed on the port B, the values are transferred or latched onto this hidden register. If the values on the two registers are different, an interrupt occurs. Also, the comparison on the two registers are only performed on the bits that has IOC functionality, which are these top four bits. And remember that each of these four bits also has an individual IOC enable and disable bit, which allow or prevent them from being compared as well. Remember in our code, we only have RB5 and RB4 pins configured as IOC, so we currently have only these two bits being compared, the rest are just ignored. What is essentially happening in our code is that, initially, both RB5 and RB4 and their corresponding hidden bits are zero, since we're pulling them to ground using resistors on startup. When we press the RB4 button, an interrupt occurs, since the port B has 0-1 inside of it now, and there's a mismatch between the two registers. We execute the interrupt and try to clear the flag, but since I'm holding down the button, the port B is still 0-1, and this causes the interrupt flag to instantly set again which forces another interrupt before the main code can be executed. Only when I stop holding this button down, the port B value goes back to 0, 0, and the flag bit stops getting instantly set after being cleared. You can also read the datasheet to learn about this trap, which is also the reason why I recommended reading the dedicated datasheet sections for interrupts in the first place. To fix this problem, we can just read the state of the port B register before clearing the interrupt flag which will cause the new port B value to be latched onto the hidden register. This way, whenever the interrupt routine gets executed, the new values to compare with the port B register will also get updated. You can try to read the port B register into a throwaway variable to do this, like this, but there's a better way to do it. In XC8 compiler, you can just write a register's name like this, to read it and discard its return value. This is implemented especially for occasions like this, where you need to read a register to have a certain thing happen, but don't actually care about the return value of the register itself. But now, we have another problem. If you read the datasheet, it tells you that you need to execute at least one instruction after reading port B before you can clear the interrupt on change flag. Now, this may change between compiler to compiler or version to version, but for me, both of these lines take one instruction to execute, which you can confirm if you check the assembly code. So we need to put a nope instruction after this line, before we can clear the interrupt flag. To show you why you need to do this, let me comment out this nope instruction and program our microcontroller. Do you see what is happening when I hold down the buttons?
The LEDs are not turning off for one second, right? They are turning off for two seconds, which means two consecutive interrupts are occurring whenever a state change occurs. This is because we're reading the port B here, but since we haven't spent an instruction cycle before clearing this interrupt flag, it instantly gets set again, which causes another interrupt. But after the first interrupt, since we read the port B register, the hidden registers got updated, so no further interrupts will occur after we clear the flag again in the second interrupt. So each time a state changes, two interrupts will occur, since we're clearing the flag bit too fast. Now let me uncomment this nop instruction and program again. This time, as you can see, on each state change, LEDs turn off for one second, so only one interrupt is occurring on each state change. Now I hope you understand why I recommend not using interrupt on change, unless you have to. There are a lot of traps for beginners, and most people avoid using this interrupt source altogether. But for those who are interested, there are still a couple more examples to go through, and they only get more complicated. So, let's keep going. On this example, I'll show you how you can pseudo detect the triggering edge of an IOC interrupt. This is going to be the IOC example too. You can actually use software trickery to detect if an interrupt occurred on rising or falling edge. Now, this is going to get a little complicated, so feel free to stop and reread the code, or rewind and listen again. As always, I'll put comments for all of my codes. There will be some bitwise manipulations, so if you don't understand the code, feel free to watch my bitwise operations and the second half of the introduction to pick datasheets video, where I talk about them. Now, let's get started with the example. To determine if the pins went from low to high or high to low state, we need to compare the current and previous states of the pins. Since the interrupt occurs after the state change, we'll only have access to the current state of the pins in the interrupt routine which means we have to save the current state of the pins within the interrupt routine, which then can be used as the previous state in the next interrupt. Let's put that into code so you can understand it better. First things first, I'll create global variables for saving the states of the RB5 and RB4 pins. I'll make separate global variables for each pin, which will make writing the code easier. It'll also be better for the next example. I'll also initialize them as zero, since the initial states of the pins are zero, because of the pull-down resistor we have connected to them. Also, make sure to use this volatile qualifier whenever you have a variable that you're using in an interrupt routine. I'll talk about this more in the next video, but for now you can just ignore it. In our interrupt routine, we need to read the current state of the RB5 and RB4 pins, but since we have no debouncing on our buttons, we should put a little delay before reading their status. I've found that 50 milliseconds works pretty well. Now, you can read the state of these pins explicitly, like this, but I recommend avoiding that. For this example, this would work fine, but if you write the code like this, the microcontroller will read the status of port B twice for each of these lines. What if the state of port B changes in between these lines? We can't push the button fast enough for this to matter for this example, but you should still get into the habit of reading the port B only once, like this in case this does matter in your application in the future. Also, you don't have to put volatile qualifier here, since this is a local variable in the high priority interrupt routine. This variable won't be changed in any other part of the code. I'll again talk about that more in the next video. Now that we read the whole port B register in one go, we can extract the RB5 and RB4 pins' states from it. This way, even if the port B changes state throughout the code, it won't matter, since we'll be using this saved variable instead. We'll also create separate local variables to hold the state of RB5 and RB4 pins, so we can separately compare them to their previous states. We can use these lines to extract them. I've already talked about this in the aforementioned previous videos, but let me explain again. We are essentially clearing all of the bits of this port B, except the RB5 and RB4 bits, by using the end operation. Then, we're shifting these bits all the way to the right, so we can have a pure 0 or 1 value of their current state. Now, we can compare these current states of the pins to the previous ones to determine if they went from low to high or high to low. We can use if statements for that. We can say, if the previous state was 0, and now the current state is 1, the pin transitioned from low to high state. And we can do the same for both RB5 and RB4 pins. You can combine these in one if statement, but as always, I'm prioritizing explicit coding over an efficient one, so you can inspect it easier. 
The same way, we can check if their previous states were 1 and their current state now is 0, which will mean they transitioned from high to low. I'm using else if statements so that we handle one change at a time. If you need to handle them separately, you can use if statements for each one of these instead. Now, I'll make it so that if they transition from low to high, only the top LED will light up, and if they transition from high to low, only the bottom LED will light up. Now, at the end of our interrupt routine, we need to actually save these current states as the previous ones for the next interrupt to occur, but we have a problem. Since we have a whole second delay here, the current state of the port B can easily change within this interval, even with a slow button press, but we want to save the last current port B state before exiting this routine, so no false interrupts occur. Because of that, I'll actually read the port B again, using the same method we did before, but this time, I'll save them as the previous states for the next interrupt to use, and since these lines are here now, we don't need to put nope instruction anymore, since they will provide the one instruction delay we need before clearing this flag. I hope you could follow that. This is a bit complicated, but it has to be done if you want to detect transitions. This code can be written smaller, but again, I'm choosing explicit coding over an efficient one. Now, let's program and see. If I press the buttons once, only the high transition is detected, since high transition happens before the low transition when we press the button. And because we're reading the status of port B before exiting after one second, the release of the button doesn't cause another interrupt, since the button is already released before this one second delay is done, and the release state of the button ends up becoming the previous state. But if I hold down the buttons for longer than one second, you can see that a high transition is detected first, indicated by the top LED lighting up. Then, when I release the button, a low transition is detected, indicated by the bottom LED lighting up. And of course, this also works for the other button, since we also check it in the code right here. I know that this example was a leap compared to my previous ones. If you couldn't understand something, feel free to ask me in the comments below. On this example, I'll show you how we can detect which of the IOC pins specifically change state. This is going to be the IOC example 3. When you think about it, we already implemented this functionality with our previous example. For example, if this if statement is true, the RB5 pin changed state, and it was a low to high transition. Or if this statement is true, the RB4 pin changed state, and it was a high to low transition. So technically, this code is already accomplishing our task and some more, by also detecting their transitions. But I'll quickly modify this code to make it easier to visualize it. I'll make it so we don't care about the transitions, that was for the last example. Instead, I'll just check the RB5 and RB4 pins once and compare them to their previous states. This works because we made it so that these variables are either 0 or 1 by using the AND and SHIFT operations up here. This way, we can just check if the previous RB5 is different than the current one, or if the previous RB4 is different than the current one, using this NOT equal to operation. I'll make it so that if the RB5 change state, only the top LED will light up, and if the RB4 change state, only the bottom LED will light up. Let's program and see. And as you can see, if I press the top button, the top LED lights up. And if I press the bottom button, the bottom LED lights up. So we're able to determine which button was pressed through software tricks. All of these examples should be enough to implement everything you can using interrupt on change. But before ending this video, let me tell you some extra information. You shouldn't use interrupt on change with really fast switching signals because of a problem with this feature. But be careful, when I say fast, I mean fast in the world of digital signals. A rotary encoder or a button might be fast for us humans, but for a microcontroller, they are very slow. Microcontrollers take microseconds at most to execute most commands, which for this microcontroller can be even as fast as nanoseconds, depending on the instruction. By contrast, even if you try to press and release a button as fast as you possibly can, it'll take about a couple tens of milliseconds at the very least. That is orders of magnitude slower than what a microcontroller can react to. By fast switching signals, I'm referring to time-based sensors and such, the ones that can change state within micro or nanoseconds. There are two problems with reading fast signals. Problem number one. As also stated in the datasheet, it takes three to four instructions to jump to an interrupt routine. But the problem is, this is without the overhead of saving the registers the microcontroller is currently working on, or the if statements we're checking at the beginning of the interrupt routine. 
When you're in the micro or nanoseconds domain, this means that by the time you read the port B register, the pins that caused the interrupt might have already changed states again. At that point, you're probably better off with a faster microcontroller or with using other methods which I won't get into. But to make it a little better, you can read the port B at the beginning of your interrupt even before checking any if statements like this. This won't exactly solve the problem, but it will allow you to read the port B as fast as possible without the delay caused by these if statements. Problem number two. As also stated by the datasheet, if a signal changes during a read operation of port B, it might not cause an interrupt, which means you might miss a state change if it happens during your read operation, which is more likely to occur for faster switching signals. Whether that's okay or not depends on your application but I want you to keep in mind that this problem does exist. Lastly, the datasheet states that if the microcontroller is reset through MCLR or brownout reset, the hidden register won't be reset, which means they will still hold the last value they had even after these resets. Remember, MCLR reset happens when you give a low signal to the MCLR pin of the microcontroller, which then causes the microcontroller to reset. And brownout reset happens when the voltage on the power rails go below a certain threshold, which then causes the microcontroller to reset. But for these resets to happen, these functionalities have to be enabled. You can watch my configuration bits video to learn more about that. This may cause the interrupt on change to not behave the way you would think on reset, but it's highly application specific. For our example, it doesn't really matter. But if it does matter for your application, luckily this problem is very easy to solve. You can just read the port B register before enabling the interrupt at the beginning of your code. This way, even if a reset occurs, you'll have manually updated the hidden registers before enabling the interrupt. But remember, we need at least one instruction after reading port B before we can clear the flag bit. But instead of adding a nope instruction, you can just do this read operation one line above, like this. This way, since this line will also take at least one instruction to execute, you won't have to put a needless nope instruction. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe. It's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.